It is now my pride and my pleasure to be able to introduce to you Salva Dut, and we're going to have a little interview with him up here. So Salva. Am I on here? Is that my fault? OK, good. Um, I'm going to start out with a few questions for Salva, and then we are going to go to questions submitted by um, the audience, both the real audience and the online audience. OK. Salva, we have an audience full of students and another audience, a virtual audience. What are they doing to help Water for South Sudan? How do they help you? Students are helping Water for South Sudan tremendous time. And thank you guys for what you've been doing. And thank you for coming as well. Uh, without a student, we wouldn't be able to drill 260 wells today. And especially with the work you're doing with the iron giraffe, boosts our budget really nice. Uh, thank you for that. Students all around the world are doing a wonderful work. And that means what are you doing here? You are reaching out to the community that cannot help themselves. And that shows the responsibility. Now you are the one taking care of the world, if you look at it. The little thing you're doing has a fund or something like that, doing fundraising goes way, way, way down. You are changing a life of people who cannot help themselves. And thank you for that. That's great. OK. Um, I think you started drilling wells 2005. Was that the first well? 2000? Yes. Yes, OK. So how long does a well last? Do they break down? I mean, it would be awful, wouldn't it, if a village had a well then all of a sudden didn't have one? So how, you know, how are the wells doing, the, the older ones? And how do you make sure that they keep working for people there? Great question. Nothing lasts forever, guys. It's been ourselves. If we don't get up in the morning and take a shower and clean ourselves, you would be filthy, correct? If you don't brush your teeth, you will get cavity, something like that. That means even the metal doesn't last. And you need to make sure if you put the well there, make sure you have people you train to be able to maintain that well. Good thing, Water for South Sudan wells have been doing well since we uh, drilled them in 2005. They are still functioning today because of what we did. Making sure they know where to get the supplies, we keep, we, uh, making sure they know how to put the fence around to keep the animal away. But when you are doing something, you are learning along the way too. Even we, Water for South Sudan, we are learning as well. Two years ago, we sent Angelique from the board to go and see the old well we drilled in 2005 or 10 years ago. And uh, we're still learning there, and we find out that uh, some of the platform we build around it is uh, getting erosion. It's been watching out, but it's still there. That, then what we did, we said, okay, now we will have a rehab team to go back and look for the old well we drilled 10 years ago to make sure if they need support, then we drill them. We, uh, we help them out. But the good thing, to have a well that will last that long, make sure you get the right aquifer. Aquifer is water table in the ground. If you don't get there to the deep one, that well might dry and you cannot do anything with it. But as long as you get to the right t water table and uh, teach people how to maintain it, that well will last for 20 to 50 years. OK, so that's after you've put the well in. What about before? What does a village do? You know, you've picked the village. You're going to get a well, right? What do the people there do before your crew gets there? They have to do some preparations? Yes, uh, because this well is belong to them. It's not the well for water for South Sudan. It's a well for this community, and you need to empower them to show them that this one belongs to you. If you don't take care of that, you will not do it. And when we are coming for that assessment, what we do is we call the village that get the well and say, hey, guys, this is what you need to do. 
you need to clear the road because there are no roads there in South Sudan for our equipment to come in. You need to dig the water pit where we put the water for lubrication when we are drilling. And they need to do all the things we need to do, like loading off all the drilling and pipes on the trucks. And all those sort of things, we tell them after that, we get them involved to help with their drilling as well. After they see that they are really involved and they are part of that process, they feel like they own it and it belongs to them and no one will take it away from them. And this is the thing we do. After we finish the well, we drill it, then we train them and say, who will be in charge? But what would happen? If you take someone to maintain the well all the time and you don't pay him or her anything, is that person is going to stay? No. The households that drink in that well, they have to do something to be able to pay this person or to get the spare part that they need. And they have a committee that sit there to collect whatever they can collect, chicken if they don't have many, or goods to be able to give it to that guy who maintained their well. And that system has been going well so far. And these are the process that are involved with uh, drilling a well. Right, wow. Okay. Um, you talked earlier about how Water for South Sudan keeps learning and developing. So there's the rehab program to rehabilitate. Uh, the wells are all working, but sometimes, again, the concrete platform gets um, messed up by animals. It gets trampled and cracked, and so that's what the, a lot of the rehabbing is of the concrete platforms. But there's another new program that Water for South Sudan is doing related to the wells, and that's the hygiene program. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, we have hygiene program. You know water is a life. And sometimes if you don't take care of that water, you might get sick from it too. Like before when we don't have well, they go and find the water, bad water, they drink it and then they get sick from it. And we need to make sure the hygiene, we teach people around it to make sure if you take water, wash your hand first. Because you might have germs and they are nail or something like that. And you need to make sure also you don't just wash your stuff around the well. You have to move away from the well if you are cleaning something. If, and the container that you take uh, water with, if you don't clean it once in a while, the germs might grow inside. And that one, we have to teach them. And also, too, we do it very well with the school, where the schools are. Because we have some wells in the schools. When we put the well, then the school get built. We need to teach these children. Because it's easy for children to grow up with health, understanding the health. And when we teach them, whether you use the latrine or whatever, when you go to the bathroom, make sure you wash your hand. When you are drinking, make sure you wash your hand. If you are drinking with your hand. And now we are t our hygiene is teaching the schools and the community to make sure they are taking care of themselves, not to contaminate the water too they have, and making sure they are healthy. And it's easy too when you train kids, they would be able to to grow up while they are healthy and be able to to uh, to teach their parents as well. And that's the other department that we add in. Uh, so in addition to, hy their hygiene program is one where they're training people to, um, you know, healthy practices to do with the new well, to do with water. And uh, in a year or two, Water for South Sudan is also going to institute a sanitation program, which means toilets. Toilets are a big deal, <laughs> right? Try to imagine your life without a toilet. Maybe some of you have gone camping and things like that. Not something you want to be a permanent thing. Um, the development of sanitation is huge in human history. Right? As soon as you have toilets and a way to get rid of human waste, once again, the standard of living, the incidence of disease, everything, everything gets so much better. So that's another piece of the puzzle. And um, you've got clean water now. If you have clean water, you can work on hygiene and toilets. So uh, the sanitation program is going to be in the, yet another aspect of Water for South Sudan's work. Sure, yeah. absolutely. Hygiene and sanitation, they are hand to hand. Yeah. And next season, we will start with sanitation as well because it's very important. And uh, for you not to put the waste close to your area or to where your well is, it's very important to have that. And yes, we're going to start on that as well. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, the development in Western science that we get sick from germs, 
which we cannot see, right? That's huge. And if you are working with an uneducated population who's never been exposed to those kinds of ideas, well, why shouldn't I go to the bathroom in the same water that I wash my hands and drink? <laughs> Right? So, you know, they need to be taught about stuff like this, and as soon as they start teaching, as Salva said, especially the young people, they will pass on that knowledge, and the standard of living will rise. Okay, um, so there was this horrible civil war that lasted more than 20 years. South Sudan won its independence in 2011. There was a couple of years of peace and a real challenge. Brand new country. What do you do first? Okay, hard questions. But unfortunately, in 2013, another war broke out, this time a civil war within South Sudan. So I check the Water for South Sudan blog often because I worry about my friend Salva working there in South Sudan. And he has promised me that where they're drilling is not where the war is. That's right, right? OK. But will you talk about a little bit about um, what's happening in South Sudan today? Do you think there's an end in sight? Do you think people will be able to live in peace? Yes, I'm very hopeful people will live in peace someday. It's just a matter of time to put in, and they will. You know, uh, living in a tribal line is not that easy. That's the first one. Second, coming out from the war, you're already traumatized. The only thing you know is war. Mm -hmm. And now with Water for South Sudan, drilling well to all these tribes to make sure they are peaceful. And now education is coming in, and education is the key for the peace where you can understand. Like if I have someone in my tribe who is a president, and someone doesn't like him from another tribe, do I have a right to protect that person because he's from my tribe? No. If he's not doing well, he doesn't deserve to be there. But over there, if you have one in your tribe who is a president, the whole tribe will stand behind you, even though they are not getting benefit from it. And it's because of lack of education. If they are education, if they have education, because each individual will know what is your benefit and what is your right. And now because big percentage, I would say 85% is illiterate is uneducated in South Sudan, and they don't understand what their right is. And now with water for South Sudan, we have water, school is coming in. What would happen with that generation that get education? Sooner, they will be the one to change their will and making sure they all have to work together. It doesn't matter what tribe are you from, what gender are you are. And that's what I've been trying with Bowie from Agua Africa, he's from Nuer, to make sure that we can bring peace to this tribal line. Making sure we go to this area of Nuer and Dinka and other tribe as well, that we can work together. I myself, you know, something you read in the book, I didn't choose to revenge. I choose a peace, something that will bring us together. Because if I revenge, or if someone else revenge, what are we going to do? We will finish ourselves, and we will never get anywhere, and we will never get developed completely. And revenge doesn't help the world and doesn't help people. And I'm sure peace will come someday in South Sudan, fully one. It's just a matter of time, because we still, all these commanders, leaders who are running South Sudan government now, there were rebel commanders before. They were coming from the war. And they don't understand the development. But soon, next generation is going to kick in. Like example, I came here to this country coming out from the war. I get this education. That's why now I'm not killing people. I choose to fight for peace. And now we have a lot of lost boys. Like I myself, we have some lost boys there working with Water for South Sudan. And we have some lost boys to remain in that camp. Now they are the teachers with those schools we're talking about. And peace will come. And this, how the peace is started. What you guys are doing here, doing a fundraising to Water for South Sudan, you are bringing peace and you are building peace in South Sudan. And thank you for that. Sorry for taking long on that. No, that was really important. I do, yeah, amazing. It's amazing. I mean, to think about um, by reading the book, 
by talking about the book, whether or not you fundraise, by fundraising, by educating yourself, you are all helping to save the world a tiny step at a time. Keep up the good work. All right, um, I think what we're going to do now is we're going to go to questions from you all, and we're going to have some help again from our MCC students for that. Hi, everyone. Uh, the first question is going to be for Salva. Uh, from Stillwater Junior High School in Stillwater, Minnesota, how plentiful are the underground aquifers in South Sudan? Is there enough water for the population if it can be accessed? Yes, we have plenty of water in uh, South Sudan. Some years back, I think 2006 or uh, five, the United Nations did a great survey to see the water ground in Sudan and they find a great lake underneath. And now the well we are using, or the well we are drilling, they are refillable wells because we have a rainy season there. And when the rainy season comes, we refill those uh, wells. And also we still have a tap on that lake under the ground in, water, uh, in South Sudan. That means we have plenty of water there. And uh, so far, all the well we drill and we really hit the right aquifer, they never dry up. If when the dry season come, they still uh, running well, and uh, we have enough water to sustain. Okay. Uh, the next question sorry. is also for you, Gonzalo, from Oliver Middle School in Brockport, New York. What are the steps to building a well? Good question. The step is a long way, but I will break it into two pieces. The step to build a well is right here. You guys are doing fundraising now. If you don't do fundraising, would I be able to drill the well there? No. Where can I get the money to buy all the supply that I need? We do fundraising here. We wire the money to, to Africa. But in South Sudan, we don't have any infrastructure completely. This country been in the war for a decade and everything was destroyed. And nothing, no manufacture completely zero. And what we have to do, we have to go to another country and purchase all the supply that we need, it's starting from the hand pump, the cement that you can put the flood form, the diesel fuel that you can use to drill, the food that we will take, take it with us, uh, the lubricant for Indian oil to do the service on the car, all the spare parts we need, all the casing pipes, all those kind of things. We have to push them from another country and then drive for two weeks to go to South Sudan. And when we get there, we have to get there the, under the, to the government to give us the tax exemption letter not to tax us. And drive another time to get to our area where we have our companies. That's a big picture. Second stage, is when we get to the compound, we have to organize, make sure we assemble everything. The rig is being lubricated. All we change Indian oil. We know what to do with hygiene, with uh, other stuff as well. All the mechanics are ready to go. Drilling, uh, the driller is ready to go. Then we have to go to the villages to go and do the assessment to see what village would get the wells and what village would wait. We don't do it ourselves. We just take a message there to this community and say, hey, you have 30 villages, and we have only five wells. Who will get the well and who will wait? And there, they sit by themselves because we don't have to make a choice. If we make a decision, they might say, why we favor the other village? We let them do their own choice. And then they come to us, and they said, Mr. Axe and Axe will get the well. Then we meet with this village chief, and we said, you need to clear the road, and uh, we will come and after two days or three days after you clear your road. And then we drive all the equipment and come in. And it's that all the process I told you before, making sure they know what to do. And after we drill it, then we train them and we leave them with a spare part. And then from there, we leave to another village. That means if you assemble everything complete and you are in the side of the well, drilling that well will take three to, uh, to six days, depending on the breakdown. If you don't have too much breakdown, it will take three days for if you don't have any breakdown. If you have breakdown, it might go to six days. This is how long it takes. Cool. 
The next question is for Linda Sue uh, from my Spry Middle School in Webster, New York. Why did you choose to juxtapose Salva and Nia's stories? Okay. I'm often asked this question. And um, when I started writing Salva's story, there were two parts of his life I was really interested in that I thought young people would really be interested in reading. And that was his escape from the war, you know, that horrible, harrowing journey. The other part was what he's doing now. Okay, so he was 11 when this happened. He was in his 30s when he started Water for South Sudan. I had these two parts of the story with this huge hole in the middle. Now, I could have written everything, the whole thing, but the book probably would have ended up around 400 pages then, and I didn't want that. I wanted a <coughs> short book, around 100, 125 pages, because I wanted teachers to be able to use it in the classroom with students. So in order to do that, I had to keep the book short. All right, so I could write Salva's life, and then I could put something like 20 years later, and it would just be so obvious what a huge hole there was in the story, right? So I wrestled with this problem for quite a long time. I tried different things. I wasn't sure what I was going to do. But when my husband got back from his first visit to South Sudan with Salva in 2008, he had all these photos of young girls and young women who carried water for so many hours a day. And he had interviewed them and spoken to them and so forth. And I realized, I'd thought about it before, but I realized then that when Salva puts a well in a village, it is a huge thing that happens to somebody else. Okay? Somebody else is not going to have to walk for water anymore. Somebody else is going to have the chance to do something else with their lives with every single hour of the day that they used to have to walk to out for water. So what if I introduced a second character like that, whose life is about to change really dramatically, and then what if I took that character from this part of the story and moved her right up here to the beginning, alternating, so that maybe people won't notice the hole in the middle so much. <laughs> so that's what it was. It was kind of um, a literary a device that I was using to try to, um, to kind of um, not make people so like, what happened in the middle here? You know, sort of covering up that middle gap in the story. Um, so that is why I chose to tell the story alternating chapters between Salva and this girl named Ya. Uh, the next question is for Salva. Um, Salva, are you still in contact with any of the other lost boys? Yes, I'm still in contact with uh, other lost boys. Even uh, in the field, we have three lost boys or four lost boys that work for Water for South Sudan. Some they used to they used to live in Texas and. When we, I called them to join Water for South Sudan, they came, and they are wonderful. On the other hand, if you read the book, the group I was in, we were 1,500 boys. That 1,500 boys didn't come to U.S., all of them, no. Maybe 40, 50 guys from that group came here, including me. And uh, those guys from that, 50 or 40, I have 10 guys here in Rochester, and we're always in touch. And some are in the other state as well. Also, we have those who couldn't make a life, and we have those who were in refugee camp, left there, and they get some education. Now they went back at the teachers in those uh, schools we have there. And some join military, some join the other institute. And uh, whenever I'm there, we meet, and then we Sometimes we even get together and have lunch or dinner. And yes, I'm still in touch with them. Yeah. Uh, the next question is for Linda Sue from Elizabeth C. Adams Middle School in Guilford, Connecticut. Uh, does water in the title have any figurative meaning like life or freedom? Um, I needed a title that would work for both parts of the story, Salva's story and Nya's story. So obviously, Nya walks a long way for water every day, so that worked for her. And Salva went on that very, very long walking journey and eventually ended up involved with water again. So I was very pleased. That's good. That's a good title that works for both halves. It wasn't until after the book came out that a reviewer wrote um, that she really liked the title because of the echo of the title of the book, A Long Walk to Freedom. That is the title of Nelson Mandela's autobiography. Okay? He wrote the book in 1995, A Long Walk to Freedom. I read the book 
probably a year uh, during the year where it came out. I loved it. It was so impressive. But it was totally subconscious. Until she wrote that, I'm like, ah, oh, of course that's where I got the title. <laughs> but I'd forgotten about the title. I kind of forgot about reading the book. And, um, but, but when A Long Walk to Water popped up in my head, oh, that was like, good title. And then when she wrote that, the reviewer, because readers, readers, you guys, you often teach me stuff about my work, stuff I didn't know was there, you guys find. And in this case, of course that's where I must have gotten the title, A Long Walk to Water by Nelson, uh, my book, After A Long Walk to Freedom by Nelson Mandela. And I think that um, <coughs> wonderful Salva Dude has a lot in common with Mr. Mandela. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the next question for Salva. Um, from Wilson Middle School in Hamilton City, Ohio. How important was education in your life? Any advice you can give the students? Education is very important, guys. It has a great value, and our world should not be in this state today we are in. Look how small the globe is now today. I just came two days ago from Africa, and now I'm here with you. And now you find out about this project we are doing, Waterfall South Wells, drilling well, is because of technology and because of education. And if we don't have education, all these things around us, like if you get sick, you can go to hospital. We have a nice, wonderful sound that I'm using now, a big uh, microphone. It's all about education. If we don't have that, our world would not be a better way to do. Education, if I didn't come here and get education and get some help to be able to go back uh, and help my people, I wouldn't be able to do it. It's because of education. All the things that happen around the world, like now you find out what is the bad thing happening in South Sudan is because of education. If we don't have this media and uh, giving us all this information, we will not be able to get it. And education is very important. For you guys here, I will say that you are very lucky to be born in America. And please don't take it for granted. And you improve it already, you are not taking it for granted. Whatever education you have, that's why you've been able not to help uh, those people in South Sudan. Over there in South Sudan, people like you, they don't have all the privileges that you guys have here completely, no. They have to walk like that little nine years old you saw in the slide. That's her <coughs> job, carrying that big gallon of water to the house. She might not eat all day long, maybe she can get only one meal, but she doesn't complain. And uh, she might not have so many things. If she gets sick, she might not have Tylenol to, to take. But you here, maybe a lot of you, when you go home, you don't have too much work to do. Maybe your homework and eat and help with ditches maybe a little bit, but not that too much work. And you have to eat three times a day. But maybe some of you might complain and say, why do I have to get up every morning to go to school? What is that for now? And maybe some of you might complain and say, why I have to eat this food and not this food? But over there, they don't have that choices. Whatever come along, that's what they have to eat without complaint. That means you are very lucky here to, to be born in this life. And those people don't have it. And now, with your education, it's very important. And don't waste your education, please, with this opportunity. Whatever you have, how difficult it is with the homework or getting up in the morning, never give up. Have perseverance, have hope, be faithful, and be patient. It doesn't mean if things are difficult today on you, that's the, all your world is all collapsed. No. You just need to be patient with it. Calm down and be patient and you can do it and try, start all over again and try it. Even though you fail the grade, you fail the class, don't say that this, that's it, no. Go back again and do it. You will still catch up with your friends along the way. And this world, if we are not patient with it and have persevered, this world would not be a great world. And thank you for that. Next question for Linda Sue. Uh, from Mendham Township Middle School in Mendham, New Jersey. How has Salva impacted you as a writer? 
uh, not just as a writer, but just about every aspect of my life. And he was just getting on it to it there. He was just touching on it there. Um, I have my bad days, you know, like everybody else, when I think, God, I hate my life. Right? <laughs> um, and on those days, what I, I keep <coughs> copies of A Long Walk to Water around my house. It's got this striking cover, the orange and black, right? So I'm going through my day. I'm having a terrible day. And I catch a glimpse of that cover. <clears throat> and it reminds me. Whatever my bad day is, as I live here in the United States, it is nothing like Salva's bad day when he was escaping the war. It's nothing like Nia's bad day when she can't get enough water. Seeing that book reminds me. And I'm sort of, you know, slap upside my head. Okay. <laughs> Quit whining. Okay, just be patient. Get one little thing done. One little thing done that can make me feel better about my life. Okay, because if Selva can go through that, and look at him now, right? He's this really cool dude, right? <laughs> if he can go through all that and come out like he did, I can do it too. I can do it too without complaining, without whining, just trying to get a little bit done, trying to be patient and hopeful and trying to persevere. So it hasn't just been my writing. It's been my whole life that has been inspired by this guy. And I hope the same is true for you. And the last question is for Salva. Uh, from Menham Township Middle School in Menham, New Jersey, what would you say is a trait that young people should try to develop to improve character? I think I touched yeah. it a little bit, but I would repeat it. Just to improve your characters is all the thing that I said. Be patient, persevere, don't give up, have hope and try again. If you have all this, you will make a difference. And your world is not going to be your world alone, it's going to be a world of other people. Like what you did now, helping the other kids all around the world is because sitting in school, not quitting, and tell your family that I, we have a project here, there are some people that don't have water in South Sudan. You did it. And then your parents are you did, or you went and talked with someone else and say, hey, I need, I'm doing this project, and I uh, want to help these people. This is how this world is like. We need to work hard, and please be patient, persevere, and have hope. And thank you very much for all the help you did to Water for South Sudan. Thank you. Let's give another round of applause for Salva Duke and Linda Sue Park. <laughs>